first of all. Um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome you today to this workshop entitled Tax Avoidance and Tax Evasion in Developing Countries. I particularly thank our speakers for their presence, and I inform all of you that it, it will be also possible to follow our discussion via uh, web streaming. I'm Elish Lein, and uh, I'm going to be the rapporteur uh, on a Davis initiative report on tax avoidance and tax evasion as challenges for governance, social protection, and development in developing countries. This report will serve as a complement to the one followed by my colleague Pedro Silva Pereira on financing for development and will focus on the aspects of, uh, related to fighting tax dodging and helping developing countries in setting up fairer tax system. Uh, well, this year, the European Year of Development, we're going to face important appointments. Uh, among them, the third international conference on financing for development that, that will be held in Addis Ababa from the 6th to the 9th of July. I think we can consider this appointment of utmost importance. And that, in a way, the success of other important conferences this year, for example, the definition of the new Sustainable Development Goals, depends also on the outcome of Addis Ababa. The question is how to secure adequate financing for a truly transformative and sustainable development agenda. The Addis Ababa Conference provides the international community with the opportunity to arrive at a stronger and more inclusive international financial framework that is adequate and effective for achieving the SDGs. Official development assistance is and will remain important and has to be used more effectively, but Addis Ababa will not only address ODA. Also, domestic resource mobilization will be on the table, and that is why taxation becomes relevant. As we will be learning today, domestic resources are and will continue to be the largest source of financing for developing countries. But the average tax to GDP ratio is still too low. Combating tax avoidance and evasion can result in significant gains in revenue mobilization in developing countries. However, there are limits on what individual governments, in particular governments of developing countries which don't have strong capacity in tax ad, uh, administration, can accomplish on their own in the globalized economy. Important efforts have been made in the area of international tax cooperation, including through the OECD and G20 BEPS initiative. However, the recent strengthening of international tax cooperation is not fully inclusive and does not prioritize sustainable development and full participation of developing countries on equal footing. Moreover, cross-border illicit financial flows remain particularly problematic together with the harmful tax competition between developing countries and the resulting race to the bottom in terms of tax incentives and exemptions. Furthermore, tax treaties between countries, such as double taxation agreements, could be negotiated with sustainable development ob objectives in mind and taking more into consideration developing countries' perspective. The aim of today's workshop is to provide a forum for a more in-depth exchange of views on these issues in light of the work of this Parliament on the report I'm honoured to follow as a rapporteur through which the Parliament might express its strong view on such issues ahead of the Financial for Development Conference. I'm very happy to see the presence of some of the colleagues also. I will be uh, glad to cooperate in drafting the, the, view, uh, the, the, the report. Unfortunately, my colleague Hugh Bayet from the ECOM committee, who's going to be uh, an associated committee to the report, uh, cannot come today. Um, he should have uh, addressed you with, with some uh, introductory remarks. But, uh, He's going to fully be on board for the work on the report. Um, so let's just start with the first panel. The workshop is divided in two parts today. The first one looks at the state of play. What are the challenges that developing countries face today when it comes to domestic revenue mobilization and fighting against tax dodging? How important are the losses of domestic resources due to tax avoidance and tax evasion? It is not easy to find re reliable data on what is lost in tax evasion and avoidance and through illicit financial flows. So that will be very helpful for the report. So I'm going to ask you if you can give us an idea. On the other hand, the second panel will focus on solutions and recommendations to tackle these problems. As you have read in the working document that we sent you, and there are some copies, I think, at the entrance available, 
My idea is to structure the, rep the report around some important recommendations rega uh, regarding, for example, information on beneficial ownership, automatic exchange of information, country-by-country -country reporting, the proposal for a real intergovernmental body on tax matters, and the need to include a gender analysis and perspective. Because of time constraints, I would propose that every speaker talks for about 10 minutes, and I, accept, I expect to engage in a fruitful discussion with all the participants and with the panelists. Without further ado, I'll give the floor to our first speaker, Ms. Giulia Mascagni. She's a researcher from the International Center for Taxation and Development and author of the European Parliament report Tax Revenue Mobilization in Developing Countries, Issues and Challenges. Some copies uh, are there as well. So, Giulia, you have the floor for about 10 minutes. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for the introduction as well. Um, my name is Giulia Mascagni. I am a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, and uh, my work is mostly on taxation with the ICTD, which is the International Center for Tax and Development. Um, the ICTD, uh, I thought that I would just say a few words uh, on that for those of you who are not familiar with the organization. Um, it is a research organization. Uh, but the kind of research we do, uh, it's really an intersection between academic work and uh, policy issues. Um, and to do that, we have established uh, in the past four years a network of people, uh, mostly based in Africa, but also uh, some of us are based in Europe and then spending quite a lot of time in Africa. Um, the characteristic of this network really is, besides the fact that it's international in nature, um, it includes a variety of people, so there's researchers, academic researchers, but also practitioners, um, officials from revenue authorities, um, etc. So with that introduction, um, I don't think I need to go into much details about why tax is so important for developing countries. If you're sitting here, you probably know why. Um, I would just like to say that uh, it is not, not just about taxes generating resources for development. That is a very important issue, but it is not the only one. There's very important positive side effects um, to tax revenue mobilization. What are they? State building. Um, taxation can help in generating democratic institutions, in establishing uh, and strengthening them. Uh, ownership of development processes by developing countries and independence from foreign aid in the long run but also tax revenue helping countries tackle issues like tax evasion and avoidance can help in fighting issues like money laundering and in finding proceeds from criminal activities, uh, corruption and, uh, and uh, illegal activities like that. Of course, it's not, they're not the same issues, but some of the efforts going towards fighting tax evasion and avoidance can also help a set of broader issues. Now, said all of that, um, Investing time and money into um, tax revenue mobilization seems like quite a good investment because there's quite a lot of beneficial uh, effects that come out of it. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite striking that it is only recently that uh, this topic has really gained big prominence in the, in the international debate. Um, and that is true for the aid debate, but it's also true for the international processes that are currently led by the OECD. Now, the crisis certainly had something to do with it, um, both because it made the prospect of declining aid budgets more realistic, uh, but also because it made fiscal issues so much more prominent in Europe and in the US, and by reflection in the uh, development debate as well. So the, the important thing to say here is that there is a real momentum here, and there is an opportunity to generate some positive change in this area, which was not the case perhaps 10 years ago or so. Now, um, I would like just to give you a few... Um, highlights on the current uh, uh, situation in terms of taxation in developing countries. Um, there are some differences, important differences, when it comes to the comparison between developing countries and high-income OECD countries. One of them is that developing countries rely heavily on taxes from trade and from uh, corporate profits. So, for example, if you take the corporate um, income tax, in uh, high-income OECD countries, it contributes about 8-10% of total revenues, whereas in developing countries, it's almost twice as much, about 20%. Uh, 
Um, on the other hand, domestic uh, taxes, the kind of taxes that are really important for countries here in Europe, for example, um, VAT, personal income taxes, they are there in developing countries, but they don't contribute as much. Why am I telling you this? Uh, because this difference, uh, this difference in the tax structure makes quite a big uh, difference when it comes to tax evasion and avoidance, because these issues are much more important for developing countries, because they rely more on the sort of tax bases that are vulnerable to, the, to these issues. Um, it is a bigger problem for them because they don't have that many alternatives uh, in terms of tax bases and they cannot afford to turn a blind eye on multinationals avoiding taxes. Now, when it comes to the aggregate uh, tax rate, we normally use the tax to GDP ratio, which has problems, but it is also a measure that is the measure that is most often used. You see that uh, in recent years in developing countries, there's been an increase in the tax to GDP ratio, but it's been quite low. Um, now, that is a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it shows how tax revenues are a very stable source of revenue, as opposed to other revenues, for example, from natural resources or even aid. Um, it is a bad thing because it means that it's, it's probably not realistic uh, to think that we can increase revenues, tax revenues dramatically in the short term. Um, now, tax revenues are still low in developing countries, but what is perhaps more important, uh, they are below potential. So we know there is a tax gap between what is collected and what can be collected. Now, I'm not going to give you an estimate of what that tax gap is. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, but what I want to give you is uh, three main issues that contribute to generating and widening that gap. The first one has to do with multinationals and the practices that can, they can adopt to avoid paying taxes. Transfer pricing is just one of them. There's many others. They're very complex, very technical, and there's not a lot of people around the world who fully understand the details. And I'm gonna come back to this later. Um, the second one is tax incentives. This is essentially tax revenues that are foregone by governments by law. It's not even tax avoidance. It's a whole separate issue. The third one has to do with extractive industries. These industries generate a lot of rents that are often not shared equally between the countries that have these resources and the companies that extract them. Now, one could think that um, Actually, if we, if we solve these three problems, we already would go quite a long way into closing that gap, that tax gap. And European countries and OECD countries in general have tried some initiatives to actually um, close these gaps, and you know, there are some solutions out there. So one can think, you know, why can't we fix it for developing countries using the solutions that we have already tested in other contexts? And I think the reason is threefold, um, and these three different sets of constraints that are particularly acute in developing countries. The first set, set is administrative constraints, and it has to do with what the revenue administrations are able to do, what do they have the capacity to do. And I would say that this has more to do with the human resources and the skills of their staff rather than with the money. Of course, money would help them. But perhaps that's not the bigger constraint. The constraint is having people who fully understand the technicalities when it, when it comes to tax multinationals and people who will want to stay revenue administrations and not leave to go and work for one of the big accounting firms, which is what happens a lot of the times. The second set of constraints is economic, and it has a lot to do with the, um, with the limited um, resources available from domestic uh, uh, sources. And these constraints, uh, this set of constraints is related to poverty, agriculture, particularly subsistence agriculture, and informality. In countries where these elements are widespread, there is essentially a very big chunk of the economy that is not taxable, or is very difficult to tax. Now, even if you were to fully solve the administrative and economic constraints, you would still have a third set of constraints that is political. And this has to do with government officials, sometimes using tax as a tool for exercising power. Um, you can have ad hoc deals with particular uh, industries in particular sectors. You can have punitive tax audits. It has to do with tax administrators. Even when the policy is right, they can block or resist reform at the administration end. It has to do with interest groups. And of course, cross-country, it has to do with international tax competition. 
Now, I don't mean to be pessimistic here, and uh, all of these constraints certainly are not an excuse for not acting on this problem. But there, there needs to be quite a big dose of realism in terms that these constraints are real and they're not going to go away in the short term. So we need to work around them as we try to tackle the issues of tax evasion and avoidance. Um, so I hope I haven't depressed you too much uh, with all these problems and challenges. Uh, so I thought I would uh, uh, conclude with a, a bit of a more positive note. What can we do uh, about this? Um, and these are just going to be general remarks because I know we're going to talk later in more detail. But I think the first thing that we can do is recognize the progress that's been done. Um, developing countries have done a lot. Uh, the establishment of semi-autonomous revenue administrations, uh, the introduction of VAT, the wider use of information technologies, these are all very important developments in the continent, in Africa. A lot of this progress has been done with the help of donors. Um, and uh, I think in the EU there, is, there are some good examples of uh, bilateral um, uh, bi bilateral relations and bilateral support where this cooperation was particularly successful. And then, of course, the fact that now we're talking about it and there's so much attention to this, this is also a very positive development. Now, when it comes to aid, um, I think there is really a lot that can be done through aid, but still the amount of aid that goes through uh, to uh, supporting domestic resource mobilization is quite small. I only have a figure from 2007, which is 0.16% of ODA, I'm sure today is larger, but it's probably not more than 1%. There's a lot more than can be done. There were a lot of positive changes supported by, by aid, and a lot more can be done. Of course, that poses some problems in terms of harmonization, um, and, uh, and all the aid needs to be sort of driven by demand from developing countries. But there are some positive, uh, positive potential there. A lot of this work is likely to be quite basic, quite low profile, on the ground, and if you want, not very sophisticated, or if you allow, not very sexy in terms of the kind of things that are done. It's basic stuff, it's basic capacity building, stuff that is useful to combat, to com for, for fighting tax evasion at the international level, but also to improve taxation at the domestic level. And we should keep that work going. We should keep that work going at the country level, but also at the regional level. And, um, and that will be very important, the regional dimension, particularly for tax competition. Having some sort of coordination between countries, for example, in East Africa, will, will help them be more confident in scrapping their tax benefits, their tax incentives, because they know their other countries are doing the same. And on the regional dimension, probably there's quite a lot that, that you can do, because still, as European countries, we are champions in regional integration, so we, we probably can have a role there. Now, on the international side, again, the, the processes that, that the OECD is leading are encouraging because they are going in the right direction. And it is good that so many organizations are talking about this now. However, um, developing countries are still not involved enough in these processes. And by developing countries, I don't mean emerging countries. I don't mean China and Brazil. I mean developing countries, low-income countries, Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania. Um, tax evasion is a global problem and we need to treat it as such. And of course that raises a governance issue. Should the OECD be the place where these issues are discussed or should, should there be some other place? The OECD has done some steps in improving the participation, but I think the underlying question remains. Um, also there are some issues that are not really prominent in the OECD uh, process, but that are very important for developing countries like fiscal incentives. Now, a lot of these problems are really complex, and the solutions are complex as well. Um, and it is likely that by improving the current system, um, we will have some substantial benefits, but they might not be enough. Um, some of the solutions that we have right now on the table, they might just not be feasible for many developing countries. An example is the uh, arm's length principle. Many countries find it really difficult to implement. And now I'm talking Brazil and China again. So imagine other countries. There are other solutions as well, and I'm particularly thinking now, for example, formulary apportionment. Um, even if they were politically feasible, they will take time. There's big issues in terms of the harmonization of tax accounting systems. So these are not quick fixes. Now, last thing, uh, all of these things, um, the aid debate, the international processes, and the bilateral treaties, they have to show some degree of coherence. 
um, which is there sometimes, but not, not all of the times. And I think I will stop there, and um, thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Julia, for uh, uh, this very interesting presentation. I will now give the floor to Mr. David McNair. David is Director of Transparency and uh, Accountability at the One Campaign. Uh, here he will focus on government transparency and open data, uh, equipping citizens in developing countries to follow the money uh, from resources to results. So David, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Um, I've been working on this issue since 2008, I can, and I can tell you that the momentum behind this issue has never been higher, <coughs> and certainly in the time that I've been working on it. And, and this is a critical year uh, for development finance. Uh, Elie Stein has also already mentioned the Financing for Development Conference and the Sustainable Development Goals Conference, which will set the tone for development finance for the next decade at least. Um, and I think it's important to say at the outset that the European institutions and the European Parliament have played a critical role in this momentum from the, the European Savings Directive to the Anti-Money Laundering Directive, the Transparency and Accounting Directives. Europe is really leading the world on a lot of these issues. Um, and I think we need to be mindful of the potential for the European Parliament to drive these issues, to push the Commission to be more ambitious, to push member states. And you know, there are examples of last year with Ana Gomez and Judith Sargentini really pushing hard on the anti-money laundering directive. But we also need to find consensus uh, within the European institutions and make sure that we're driving these issues which have benefit for European citizens, but also have huge spillover benefits for the people living in poverty. And that's what I would like to talk, to, uh, uh, talk about um, over the next few minutes. In September, the One Campaign launched a report called the Trillion Dollar Scandal. This report, uh, as a top line, used three separate methodologies to calculate the amount of money leaving developing countries every year. And we found that at least a trillion dollars is leaving those countries as a result of money laundering, bribery, tax evasion, and other forms of corruption. And this has huge human impact. We calculated that if that money was available to be taxed and spent where the need is greatest, that money, uh, if it was invested in health systems, could save the lives of 3.6 million people each year. But this isn't just about health systems. It's about the strength of economies. It's about the accountability of governments. Um, and as we've already heard this afternoon, uh, tax is about more than just money. It's about governance. It's about the accountability of governments to their citizens. It's about redistributing revenues uh, uh, through the tax system and through the fiscal system. Uh, and that is all undermined whenever tax evasion and avoidance can take place. What we find with this report uh, was perhaps an uncomfortable truth in that much of the money that leaves developing countries ends up in the city of London, in the US state of Delaware, in Switzerland, in many of the, the rich country economies where we have the potential to do something about it. And that's what I think we have the potential to do in, in Europe. Just to look at the importance of these issues and in the context of the Financing for Development Conference, the slide here just looks at the the scale of government revenues, so-called domestic resource mobilization, uh, and the importance of that uh, for development. And you can see it over the past uh, decade increasing dramatically. So the amount of money that developing countries are collecting themselves and spending themselves on development priorities is increasing. And therefore, if we can plug the loopholes and make sure that those outflows aren't taking place, uh, there will be more money available for, for development. But it also has implications for the ability of those countries to collect revenues. Whenever you see large companies or politically exposed persons or, or wealthy individuals evading tax or avoiding tax, it makes it harder to tax the everyday citizen. So-called tax morale decreases. So you need to create incentives for citizens to pay tax as well as enforce the tax code. This slide has a lot of numbers, uh, but you'll see the color orange is quite present. Uh, and the, the countries with uh, a, an orange code are basically those where the tax share is less than 17%. Uh, 
Um, and as Julia has already mentioned, the potential for increasing tax revenues in a lot of those countries is significant if we are to build the capacity and if we are to plug those loopholes. African governments in particular are taking a leadership role in this issue. Uh, just last month, the African Union endorsed a report um, published by a high-level panel, which was chaired by the former South African President Thabo Mbeki, which highlighted that African governments lose between 30 and $60 billion a year. And they highlighted that this uh, issue isn't just about money. It's a, illicit financial flows are a source and enabler of corruption, bribery, money laundering, contributing to political discontent, loss of resources. Uh, but all this, also this issue of fairness uh, and the potential for free, free riding. And again, looking at the impact on development, that report highlights an academic report by an academic called O'Hare, who talks about the potential for achieving MDG4 uh, and the extent to which that could be achieved much quicker if illicit financial flows were curtailed. Uh, the top line finding being that if, if illicit financial flows had been arrested by the turn of the century, Africa would reach MDG4 by 2016. So there are significant development impacts. And the ONES campaign's perspective on this is that we need transparency. Whenever we don't disclose where fiscal resources are going, it leads to weaker and more corrupt governments. It leads to situations where services and results uh, are diminished, where budget allocations are, are untransparent and where citizens can't see where the money is going. Where we have information, there's potential for citizen participation in the budget process, citizen feedback and accountability on services and results, and stronger and accountable governance. So we put together a four-point action plan on how to achieve this. The first point being shining a light on anonymous companies. One striking uh, example of the role of anonymous companies in facilitating corruption is that the World Bank did an analysis of the top corruption scandals over the past two decades, and 70% of those involved anonymous shell companies. We've made progress with the review of the anti-money laundering directive, which now requires uh, EU governments to implement uh, a register of beneficial ownership uh, and we hope that as many EU governments as possible will ensure that that information is available to the public so that citizens and journalists and others can, can track where the money is going and connect that with other data sets. So we need that directive to be implemented in the strongest possible way. The second issue is around natural resources, publishing what you pay. We already have a directive in Europe uh, on accounting and, and on transparency, which is being transposed into uh, national laws. One third of the world's poorest one billion people live in resource-rich countries. And those natural resources do have the potential, if managed effectively and responsibly, to transform the lives of millions of people. But the report highlights what happens when that information isn't transparent. In Nigeria, the money stolen from oil and gas revenues since the country gained independence, could have had dramatic impacts. It could have vaccinated all of Nigeria's 29.7 million children under the age of five. It could have hired uh, almost half a million additional primary teachers, resulting in an 85% increase in Nigeria's teacher workforce. So if you get this right, you can have dramatic effects. With public information um, available, journalists can track corruption and the incentives for, for those who might want to be uh, untransparent or, or corrupt uh, decrease because they're more likely to be caught. This also has an impact on economic issues. And uh, the finance minister of Nigeria, Ngozi, has highlighted uh, that transparency on revenues has generated an improved credit rating for Nigeria and has led to increases in finance. Uh, uh, foreign direct investment of around $6 billion a year. The third issue is around cracking down on tax evasion, and there are two policy proposals here that are critical. The first is automatic exchange of information. We've seen significant pro progress at the G20, with over 50 countries adopting the common reporting standard. But what we haven't seen 
is a principle of uh, co developing countries being able to access that information even if they don't have the capacity to reciprocate. And that's a critical point because you might have a situation where Kenya, for example, wants to join this standard. Uh, but in order to do so, they will have to respond to all of the requests that the US might place on Kenya. And that's clearly not a fair situation. Um, whenever, if they were able to access that information and had the support with capacity to use it, they could track down on, on tax evaders. Secondly, country by country reporting. We have made progress in that we have now got G G20 endorsement of a, uh, a country, reporting, country by country reporting template produced by the OECD. But that template will not be open and available to citizens. And if we want to hold companies to account for where they're apportioning profit and where they're paying tax, that information needs to be available to journalists, to civil society, and the kinds of people who can track those resources uh, uh, from, from where tax is being paid right through to the results that are happening on the ground. And then the final piece is around opening up government data, support for opening up budgets. The evidence suggests that in, in developing countries, the information available on budgeting is, is fairly weak. Um, and with uh, the opening up of those budgets and the participation of citizens in that process, it can be an incredibly powerful tool in engaging citizens in improving both the allocation of that money, but also tracking where it goes in the end. These four actions add up to a powerful story of accountability, of increased revenues, um, of improved governance. But there's a lot to do. And I'll just kind of go back to where I started. There has never been higher momentum on these issues. The European institutions and the European Parliament have played a critical role in driving this forward. And in the next year, I think we need to see strong leadership. Uh, the European Parliament has the potential to push the Commission to be more ambitious, to push member states, to really get its own house in order and address some of these issues which are the facilitators of these outflows. Doing so could have dramatic effects for some of the world's poorest people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, I remember reading the report and uh, uh, when you try to build a picture of uh, what it means, one trillion dollar, uh, the report says, if you put the notes that form one trillion dollar, one after the other, you can reach the moon <laughs> and basically come back. So that is what we're talking about here. Uh, so next, uh, I, 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 I forgot to mention that you were talking about the important anti-money laundering directive, and I see my colleague here, Sargentini, uh, uh, who I welcome and who got the chance to work on that very important directive. And I can welcome also my colleague, uh, Luque, that is gonna, they're going to be both shadow rapporteur for this uh, report. So next. I give the floor to Ms. Catherine Ollier. Uh, Catherine is Policy Advisor on Taxation and Economic Inequality for the Oxfam International European Union Office. She co-coordinates Oxfam's global work on taxation and will explain us how the international framework on tax, rule, on tax rules affects and puts obstacles to the mobilization of domestic resources. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you very, mu thank you very much, Ellie. And, um, Thank you very much for inviting Oxfam um, at, to speak at this workshop. Um, so just for those who don't know Oxfam, a very quick introduction. We are an international organization working in more than 90 countries. Um, and uh, our primary mission is to work on issues related to poverty and inequality. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today because the issue of tax evasion and tax avoidance um, is a hot issue in the European Union. We've all heard about um, the um, LuxLeaks scandal with companies, but also the Swiss, Swiss Leaks scandals um, with wealthy people um, dodging taxes. So it's kind of a hot issue in, in our continent, but it's also a very important issue uh, for developing countries, as we already said. Um, so. One thing that I just wanted to, to mention very briefly uh, in an introduction, because we, we already said it's a very important issue, it's also um, tax evasion, tax dodging um, is a huge obstacle to mobilizing uh, domestic resources in countries. But it's also an issue of fairness. Um, 
the point of, of mobilizing domestic resources is to do it in a progressive way. Um, we have launched, um, as Oxfam, a campaign called Even It Up on economic inequality, um, showing that um, inequalities are growing um, in, in the world, but there are solutions to that. And tax system is a very important solution um, to fight this, this growing problem. And when people escape taxes, um, it's, a huge, um, it's a huge issue of fairness and justice. Um, we see that you know, if, if people don't pay their fair share of taxes, this is also a big factor of increasing economic inequality. Um, so for the presentation, I don't know. Um, so um, for this presentation, I'm going to focus um, specifically on, on the issues uh, around corporate tax dodging uh, for several reasons. Um, one is also because it's, it's uh, a big issue uh, in the European Union agenda because uh, the European Commission is going to make proposal this year on, on uh, corporate tax rules because it's also an international agenda uh, and also because as part of Oxfam, this is a primary focus for our inequality campaign. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so maybe just um, th this first slide is, um, is a bit of a visual um, slide for what Julia already said about obstacles to domestic resource mobilization. Um, Eli asked us to, to come up with numbers um, in, in this first panel. So uh, when it comes to tax per GDP ratio, we already said that uh, developing countries have a lower tax per GDP ratio. The numbers average between 15 and 20 percent, depending on the countries. For Europe, um, according to the latest Eurostat statistics, it's about 39 percent. So there's a huge difference um, between European countries and developing countries, which means developing countries are far away from their potential of raising taxes. Um, and I'm going to give another trillion number, um, but we've worked with a researcher in Latin America, and he has estimated that um, if we were going to close this tax gap for developing countries, um, so that's all developing countries excluding China, um, we could raise one trillion dollar. Uh, additional dollar. So that could be additional revenues that could come to states' budgets to finance, for example, um, essential services uh, like access to health or education. So on this slide you can see that there's national obstacles and international obstacles. I'm not going to go too much into details because Julia has already raised several of them, um, including weak tax administrations, a huge informal sectors in countries, the, um, huge tax uh, exemptions or incentives that are uh, granted to some people. I want to focus more on the international obstacles because this is where um, we have issues around illicit financial flows and international corporate tax rule, which is the, the, the purpose of, uh, of the discussion today. Um, so I just wanted to add a slide on, on the issue of the scale of the problem. Here I've um, very nicely copied um, numbers from other colleagues. We work very closely with other NGOs on that. So the graph is from your dad, who's going to be in the second panel, which I think is a very powerful number that says that for every uh, dollar that developing countries gain, they lose more than two dollars. Um, and as part of the $2 they lose, illicit financial flows is 33 cents of those $2. So the problem of illicit financial flows, it's, it's a huge, it's, it's a massive problem. Um, Global Financial, in Financial Integrity also um, published a report in December 2014 saying that um, we have around um, 991.2 billion uh, illicit financial flows going out of developing and emerging economies in 2012. And most of those illicit financial flows uh, come from uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance, and also money laundering issues. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, if you look at um, corporate tax rate, for example, in some European countries, which could be around 30%, if you were going to tax those, those billions at 30%, you could raise an extra 297 billion. Um, so again, we're talking about a, a lot of uh, money here. Um, so focusing on corporate tax um, dodging, um, the problem is that why can company afford and large company afford you know, not to pay taxes is because the rules are inadequate. I just wanted to put back that slide. Um, it's interesting when Julia said, you know, the economic crisis um, has helped put the issue of tax evasion on the agenda. Um, 
this slide, this story is, is what we call the banana case. It's actually from 2007. So it's something that uh, we have raised um, and, um, for a long time already. Um, and, and it's quite interesting to see that actually, it's, it's, so it's a study about um, large multinationals in um, producing banana and selling bananas. Um, and they have actually, those companies have managed to create elaborate structures so they, they can shift their profits to, to some of their subsidiaries offshore. So you could see, you know, that they, the companies are paying some distribution fees to a subsidiary in Bermuda for, so for one pound of, uh, of, of revenue, 17 pence go to um, a, a Bermuda subsidiary in Bermuda, um, six pence go to a, a subsidiary in Jersey uh, for management fees. Um, then you pay, um, you know, uh, fees for the use of brands and the subsidiary in Ireland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today, we, we the rules, the global corporate tax will allow a company to shift their profits artificially so that they disconnect where they have their real economic activities and where they pay their taxes. And of course, they manage to shift those profits in countries where they pay very little taxes. Um, I think in, in, um, in Jersey, uh, the corporate tax rate is 0%, if I'm correct. Um, and, and so the effective tax rates of those companies were as low as 8%, uh, where normally um, their, their headquarters um, and where they, they, um, the companies publish their accounts would be the US, and the corporate tax rate there is 35%. So it's a very effective way of, uh, of not, paying, uh, not paying taxes. Um, and so this has been the case for a very long time. Um, so because international trade has changed a lot, um, the rules date from uh, the 1920s. Um, so there, there was a growing recognition um, that the rules were not inadequate. Uh, were, were, sorry, were inadequate, were not adequate anymore, um, which has led to um, a kind of political recognition that we need to change the system. Um, this is the, the base erosion and profit shifting reform, um, BEPS, for those who work a lot on the OECD and G20 issues. Um, it's, I mean, as NGOs, I think we have been very, very enthusiastic when the OECD came up with their first report uh, early 2013 that was kind of a diagnosis of the problem. And, and they kind of concluded that the, the international tax system was broken. So we are very pleased to, to support the OECD in this. Um, and, and they also recognize that big companies can pay as low as 5%, where small and medium uh, companies usually pay a tax rate of, of 30%. Um, but the problem is uh, this, this reform on base erosion and profit shifting um, is actually led by, by the richest country in the world. So you can see on the slide, um, the countries in green are the countries that are part of the OECD. And the BEPS reform um, has always been uh, a reform discussed in 2014 by 44 countries. So the, the um, 34 countries from the OECD plus the 10 countries from the, uh, the G20, so including countries like Brazil, China, India, etc. And so the problem is that when the process for designing the new taxes, the new tax rules are, is not fair, well, I mean, it's very likely that the, the next rules might not be fair for everyone as well. Um, developing countries are really out of this negotiation process, as you can see. Um, there's been some progress. We need to acknowledge that the OECD has, um, has tried to, to include some developing countries in the process. Uh, the latest um, announcement was that in 2015, 10 developing countries could be part of the process. But it still remains that today you have 54 countries that des decide on international tax rules, which leaves about 75% of the countries. Um, so again, if the process is not inclusive, um, there is a real problem that the rules that are going to be decided um, take some interest into account more than others. And to be clear, it takes interest of rich countries into account and not the, the interest of, the, of developing countries. So this is why uh, as NGOs, and I, I speak on behalf of Foxon, but I think other NGOs would agree with that, um, we've been now calling for the need to go beyond the BEPS process. Um, because as I said, you know, the fact that the, the process is not being inclusive, this has consequences on, on the content of the rules that are being decided. And I just wanted to give one example, um, which is, as, as David mentioned, the issue of country-by-country country reporting. So the importance of making sure that we know some kind of financial in, uh, information on large companies uh, so that we can be sure that where they have their real economic activity is where they pay their taxes. 
So um, the OECD has come, uh, has come up with this country by country reporting template, which as David mentioned, um, is not going to be public information. But also if you look at um, to which company this is going to apply, um, the, the proposal from the OECD is that it will apply to large companies that have a turnover of over 70, 70, 750 million uh, euros or higher. Um, and, and this is actually a huge problem because this is much uh, higher than what, um, what the EU um, uses it as criteria to define large companies. Um, in the EU, um, there's three sets of criteria to, to define um, com large companies. And one is uh, on turnover, and it talks about 40 million. So when the OECD is talking about 750 million. So we've calculated actually um, to, to which uh, companies would that be applied, for example, in a country like Spain. It means that only 183 companies in Spain would have to report uh, according to the OECD template, which is actually only 0.76% of all large Spanish companies. So there's a huge problem that um, not a lot of companies would not be covered by, by this. So um, to, to which extent the BEPS rules are going to benefit developing countries remains a question mark. Um, plus, there's another issue as part of BEPS is that there's a lot of things that are not covered in, in the BEPS reform. Um, we've mentioned a few already, but taxation of the extractive sector being one, um, taxation rights, so really making sure that um, profits are paid in the source country, so where the, the, um, the economic activity is, is generated, rather than where the company is at its headquarters, because it's very easy for a company to set up a headquarter in, in a tax haven. And there's the issue of tax incentive, which has already been mentioned um, by Julia. Um, I think a very powerful example is to look at a country like Sierra Leone, where um, Oxfam and others are uh, working on, the, on trying to fight the Ebola situation and where um, doctors and nurses and, and people are trying to cope with uh, the Ebola outbreak there. Um, for, for six large companies in Sierra Leone operating in 2012, they got tax incentives that were equivalent to 59% of the country's total budget. Um, so that was more than eight times the government spending on health. So if we were to, to tackle the issue of tax incentive again, we could raise a lot of revenues that we could invest in, in essential services on access to health, for example. So that leads me to my last slide, um, and I don't, I don't want to go too much into solutions because that's the discussion for the second panel. But I think there's a lot the European Union can do. Um, at the European level, to start with, there's a lot of things. Um, you know, fighting tax evasion, tax dodging is not just about um, it's not just about the money. Uh, so it's it's aid to developing countries to build capacity is important. But what is even more important is to make sure that we have the right policy framework in the European Union. Uh, by not having the right transparency framework, by letting companies being able to use the loopholes, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, but we're also not helping developing countries as well. So there's a lot of legislation that we can push, and that some have been mentioned already, that are quite important. And then policy coherence for development is also very important. I was in Senegal um, last week, and um, I was really struck by... Um, colleagues telling me that the economic partnership agreements, for example, from the European Union uh, are actually an obstacle for also for developing countries um, pushing, uh, mobilizing their resources. So the, the trade policy of the EU um, is something that could um, also impede developing countries to mobilize revenues. And at the global level, there's really two things building on, on what I've, I've just mentioned. I think it's very important to acknowledge that BEPS is just a first step. And it does not allow developing countries to have an equal say in the negotiations. So if we're negotiating international tax rules, we need to make sure that it's a real international inclusive process. Um, and that BEPS is not addressing all the issues that are really critical to solve the problem. Um, so one thing that could be a way to change uh, things is actually for the European Union to support this international governmental body on tax cooperation, which is a proposal that is right now being discussed in New York as part of the European, sorry, as part of the financing for development negotiations. Um, and, and for example, this tax is a crucial issue, so it would be very important that in Addis there is a ministerial roundtable on international taxation where all countries could participate and could debate um, the creation of this international a governmental body. And so far, the European Union has not been um, very supportive of the process, so there's a lot of scope here um, to make sure the European Union um, helps developing countries at the international level. 
I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, now I would open the floor to uh, questions, of course, or comments. And um, as the idea of this workshop is to have a wide and open exchange of views, you should all feel very free to take the floor. Just maybe introduce yourself. Okay, my colleague. Left. My name is uh, Bernd Lucke. I'm a substitute member, but the shadow on this uh, report, as you just said. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, presentations, but what I miss is actually more concrete advice on what the EU can do. I mean, you started up with the last slide here, but saying that we should ensure the right legislative framework tells me nothing. That's an empty statement. So I would really like to know what can we do um, on a much more concrete basis, where do you see deficiencies of current EU legislation? Why is it deficient? Why do you think that a proposal for doing it better actually will operate uh, better? Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other question before giving the floor back to the speakers? Anything else? Well, we can start with this one. Uh, do you want to start, David? Okay, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, if there was one thing that the uh, European institutions could do this year, I think it would be implementing country-by-country -country reporting for all sectors. We have that for the extractive sector, uh, and the Capital Requirements Directive requires that for the financial sector. Um, but re Europe would really be leading the world on in requiring companies listed in European stock exchanges to disclose key financial information, profits, uh, numbers of staff, uh, a kind of, a, a, a kind of, in a sense, a picture of where the real ac economic activity lies, uh, as almost like a risk management tool to say, okay, if you've got relatively limited economic activity, but huge profits declared in this jurisdiction, there should be questions asked of that company. And I think that would be a very powerful step. You want to, Catherine? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to compliment. Actually, I didn't want to go too much in details because I think that's, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in second panel. But if I can just build on David's answer. Um, transparency is key, definitely. And, and I think there is a right momentum right now on country by country reporting. There's a lot of discussions about it, even in, in the parliament right now, uh, in the jury committee, in the econ committee. Um, but there's, there's more than transparency. Um, David has already mentioned the issue of, of um, developing countries not having access to tax information. So we're moving to automatic information of taxes between administrations this is the new international standards but developing countries um, won't I mean most likely won't participate to the first stage of, of, uh, of this exchange of information because it's reciprocal so they won't have the capacity to send information therefore they won't receive any things so there's discussions as well as part of the um, European Commission's expert group on automatic information exchange on trying to make sure that there's uh, pilot projects for developing countries um, to be part of the system without having to send information um, just maybe you know just one thing that I wanted to mention that I haven't said because we could talk about transparency of who owns companies which is a very important issue to make sure um, uh, tax dodgers or money launderers don't use shell companies um, to, to avoid um, taxes. Um, the international governmental body which I mentioned at the very end is a concrete ask that I think we really need to um, push the European institutions to support because it could make a huge difference at the international level. One thing that I haven't mentioned in the presentation um, is, is this issue of spillover analysis. Um, the IMF has actually published a report last year looking at the impact of tax havens policies on other countries. Um, so how much neg um, are developing countries neg negatively affected by um, tax havens uh, setting up uh, you know, secrecy jurisdictions or having very low corporate tax rates? Um, and it has showed that um, this report shows that developing countries are particularly affected by tax havens um, policies, even more than rich countries. So something that could be very interesting at the European level is to do similar analysis. So having 
the European Commission uh, looking at the impact of tax uh, systems in Europe and the impact it has on other countries in Europe, but also on developing countries. So if you look at the system um, in Luxembourg or in the Netherlands and look at how much this um, tax system is negatively impacting other countries, could be something that could be also very interesting to make sure we can propose recommendations for change in the future. Thank you very much. Anything else to add? Yeah, okay, Julia. Um, just quickly, I, I agree on everything that's just been said, but um, in terms of the concrete measures, um, again, there's quite a lot that is already done by um, many countries in terms of supporting the capacity of developing countries to deal with this issue, and this is likely to have a very high impact. And, um, and these things are kind of ad hoc country by country, and, um, and they are done often on demand. But just a couple of examples. Some of the revenue authorities in Africa have been established with the help of donors. And there are successful stories there. So more of this can be done. Um, very often, it is with the help of donors that revenue authorities adopt the IT systems that allow them to use and perhaps to share in the future the information that uh, is involved in this automatic exchange of information, but also that primarily is useful for them to increase compliance. So, I mean, there's a lot of small things uh, and, um, it, that can be done in developing countries in addition to what can be done from here, which is also quite important. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we welcome also Mr. Venta. Yeah. Okay. Here you go. Dark Saran Darmian, Secretary of the Development Committee. One first thing to do against uh, tax havens, it, it could uh, appear, is to stop international financial institutions from uh, cooperating with companies who use tax havens. Now, I've heard that the World Bank... Uh, uh, does not have any such policy of, uh, of uh, not cooperating with such companies. Uh, I don't know what the situation is in relation to the European Investment Bank and, uh, and uh, national development agencies if they check uh, their partners. It's a quite important issue, I think, in, as uh, public-private partnerships are, are moving up the agenda and, uh, and blending operations are becoming more and more popular. Perhaps a comment on that. Who wants to give an answer? Uh, yeah, I can, I can try to comment on that, but I, I might also pass it on to Tove, uh, because I know your dad is doing a lot of work on this. No, you're absolutely right. Um, one thing that we have, um, I mean, related to, the, to this, one thing we've also been calling for at the European level is an, um, a European uh, common blacklist of tax havens that would go to, go to, goes together to, with sanctions, uh, especially sanctions from companies um, using those ta um, tax havens for tax purposes. Um, and one of them could be, for example, the ban on public procurement. Um, when it comes to international institutions, um, as you said, collaborating with companies, um, at the European level, there are some discussions ongoing uh, with national development institutions, uh, national development banks, and uh, the European Investment Bank. Um, that's where I might refer to your dad, because they organized a seminar a few months ago trying to raise awareness towards those institutions not to... to to use, I mean, to lend money to companies uh, that are set, set, that have setting, um, setting subsidiaries in those countries. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated dialogue because um, the national development uh, banks are also raising a lot of um, difficulties, um, but we have good hopes because we have uh, projects of collaboration, especially with the Nordics, um, DFIs, um, to try to elaborate um, criteria to make sure that they would not lend money to companies um, set up in, in subsidiaries. But Tove, if you want to add more, maybe. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for everything, for, for the question, and you can stay if you want to, uh, for the second panel, so that's Tove. I can see she can't wait for <laughs> adding her point of view on this issue. So thanks a lot. Uh, before passing to the second uh, panel, let me say that um, I really have to thank you for um, the insight that you gave us. Um, it's, it's very interesting when you say uh, for once, I mean, it's not just about the money. Maybe money is not the most important thing. It's building capacity and it's helping even more uh, in tackling this issue. 
um, I agree when you say that it's very dangerous to oblige to reciprocity in terms of automatic e exchange. I mean, uh, you have to be hypocritical to think that today um, any uh, uh, developing country uh, could be in the same position to collect this information and then exchange it. So uh, we, ha we have to be uh, very clear about that as well. Um, about the spillover analysis, I think that we're going to maybe discuss it later on, but uh, let me say that, uh, yeah, there are some governments that are actually uh, trying to do that, for example, the Netherlands, uh, and, and it's very interesting from the uh, impact assessment that they did, uh, you can see a clear impact of uh, uh, fiscal policies in that country that, uh, of course, uh, is not so good on developing countries in terms of, I, I can't remember the... Uh, the amount, but I think it was about 150 billions, maybe. Let me check. It was here. Yeah, in the range of uh, uh, millions, of course, in the range of uh, 150 to uh, 550 million euros per year. Um, so let's just go straight ahead to the second panel and let me welcome. Uh, yeah, let me welcome the first speaker who is Mr. Jose Correia Nunez, right? Uh, he's from the European Commission of DG DEFCO, head of unit of uh, the budget support and public management. Uh, Mr. Correia Nunez would give us a comprehensive overview of domestic revenue mobilization with focus on tax avoidance and evasion, explaining how the EU supports developing countries. Mr. Correia Nunez, the floor is yours for about 10 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting the Commission uh, to participate in this uh, forum. Uh, before uh, I start to speak about uh, tax evasion, I think uh, uh, I would like to, make two, uh, uh, raise two elements. The first uh, is uh, all the discussions uh, around uh, uh, domestic revenue mobilization and the ODA. I think uh, uh, this is approaching uh, and there is a debate, uh, I would say, a tension between uh, ODA and we saw the charts uh, where uh, domestic revenue mobilization contribute more to the development efforts of a country. And from the Commission perspective, we are very happy to see this because this should be the case. Uh, ODA should complement uh, uh, the resources that a country can mobilize itself. But, of course, uh, it's not only about uh, uh, the ODA that we can provide to complement, but also the efforts of the countries uh, to mobilize themselves the, uh, their own revenues. And uh, taking this uh, point as departure, of course, we cannot isolate the country from the rest of the world. So, which means in our efforts to de uh, help developing countries, ODA is important, but also is very important to help uh, developing countries to mobilize their own resources, knowing that uh, they are not isolated for the rest of the economy. Globalization obliges that uh, those issues should be tackled at different levels. And it's clear that the issue here is about, uh, the issue is about governance. It's about governance in three dimensions, and this is the way that uh, the EU, the Commission, we approach the problem. The first dimension is the public one, uh, the governments that implement their own policies. And this, uh, we have to see the issue on the transparency in terms of mobilizing the, uh, the resources, but also on the accountability, how those resources are using. Because uh, uh, I'm sure that if one looks on the tax evasion, all these indicators, and uh, we compare with the cross-cutting with the indicators on corruption, must be some kind of connection on these issues. So I think uh, at the perspective of uh, public uh, governance, it's important to address those issues at country level and to try to support those countries to fight uh, against uh, uh, internal uh, corruption, but also uh, uh, tax evasion and tax avoidance. Uh, the second level uh, of governance that is important is, of course, the global level, that we can speak about global or regional level. Of course, if we con consider uh, the EU as the most important regional bloc, of course, there is a lot of things that we can do at the regional level and also bring the discussions at the international and global level. An example is, for instance, the country-by-country -country reporting that we have adopted internally and we are supporting uh, uh, other countries to implement uh, similar 
measures. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the EITI, uh, the transparency initiative around the ITI, where the Commission is one of the main uh, actors of this process that is very much linked on the activities that we, brought, we bring internally, like the country by country report, and of course there are consistencies between the two approaches. But it's not only at regional level, but also global level. And this is maybe where we have uh, uh, some weaknesses, is to bring those issues at global level, knowing that there is no uh, single forum where we can call, call this for a global forum where those issues are discussing. We saw here uh, in, our, in those presentations uh, a few examples where we speak about the OECD, BEPS, of course, is an important international forum, but it's not the, it's the global forum. Of course, the OECD are doing efforts with other countries to bring uh, developing countries into the picture. But it's clear that one thing is to set the international standards, and uh, we can see that uh, the balance of the power is not the same between developing and developed countries when it, uh, it uh, comes to, s to fix those uh, international standards and the implementation of those standards by developing countries when they don't have the same power in discussing those standards. And this is something that we need to address. On the question what the EU can do or is doing, uh, it's clear that we need to address at global level the issue of the governance of those standards, how those standards are decided, how we can help uh, developing countries to implement those standards. And uh, you have the example on the G20 or the BEPS. There is an effort, of course, to adjust the BEPS to the developing countries. Some of us are partners of this global effort, but of course, there are still a lot of things that we need to do. There is the issue on the UN, the, the, trans the, the transformation of the UN committee on the taxation on the uh, independent, on the, on the intergovernmental committee. So those are the issues that we need uh, to, to address. So now what uh, the Commission is doing, uh, what we can improve, of course, at the regional level, the decisions that we have taken at, uh, to improve the transparency and accountability uh, within the EU, of course, we are working uh, with other partners to, to help the developing countries in two ways. One is to helping them to participate in the process how those standards are fixed at different levels and to help developing countries also to implement those standards in their uh, country, in their regions. Uh, the other issue, of course, uh, is uh, the initiatives like the ITI that uh, we think that at EU level, the only country that uh, uh, is part as a candidate country of the ITI is UK, Germany and France. Uh, they are candid they are also they will present their candidature, but I think uh, this could be also a good initiative to invite the European countries to participate in this process because the ITI fixes also standards, but those standards are on a voluntary basis. It doesn't have the same power or the same countries supporting this like the OECD BEPS. So I think uh, it's important uh, that uh, we support uh, those countries, those initiatives, and uh, when we speak about uh, the ITI, also trying to push in order that to have uh, uh, other developed countries, uh, European countries that participate in this uh, initiative. So those are a few initiatives that we are doing at the uh, EU level. Of course, uh, we can open a discussion, but I think uh, from, uh, from us the approach is to tackle these levels, these three levels of governance, and to make this a narrative that is consistent with objectives, of course, uh, tackle uh, illicit capital flows. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Correa Nunez, for these insights uh, also on the work um, of the Commission. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Nguyen Tan. Uh, he's a trained public economist with special expertise in taxation, head of the Competence Center Public Finances of GIZ, Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit, active on the field in many bilateral and multilateral projects related to helping developing countries and improving their domestic revenue mobilization. Mr. Nguyen-Tan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to this workshop. It's a great pleasure to be here today. 
Um, as I'm going to speak uh, here in this session on solutions and recommendations, um, I thought uh, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about capacity development, which is the core expertise that GIZ is working in. GIZ is a federal enterprise of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, basically implementing projects on behalf of the German government and other donors, including the European Commission, uh, in the field of sustainable development. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the issues of tax avoidance and more importantly about tax evasion from a capacity development perspective. And what you can see on this slide is basically uh, something that, is, that reiterates uh, key things that uh, previous uh, presenters today made. And the first one is that basically talking about tax evasion, tax avoidance, uh, you, can, you can take two perspectives. One is a, a domestic perspective. If you look at a country, and an inter international one. And I think it's just important to, to uh, emphasize that a lot of tax evasion, probably more tax evasion than tax avoidance, actually happens within a country. And it's, uh, uh, some of the presenters today uh, actually alluded to that. We're talking here about underreporting and the personal income tax, corporate income tax, value added tax. We are talking about um, unlawfully exploiting tax exemption regimes, uh, especially special tax holiday, holiday regimes that are in place that are usually directed at international investors but oftentimes are exploited by national companies. And we're talking about, um, you know, the insufficient enforcement of property tax taxes. Uh, uh, and I was very glad to see that the ICTD actually produced a publication on that uh, just recently. So the point here is really let's not just look at the, at the international uh, dimension, which is uh, well covered now by the BEPS, and uh, uh, despite that, I'm going to, to comment uh, on the BEPS now, but this was the, f the first thing I wanted to, to make uh, here in my talk. Um, this is very uh, just uh, an overview of uh, where GIZ is currently uh, operating uh, projects on behalf of several uh, partners, um, uh, and I'm going to just mention this because I'm going to cite five countries that you see here um, uh, because uh, GIZ staff from these countries actually uh, reported back to me on, on some of the issues that we're going to discuss today. Um, so let me briefly uh, give you an idea of uh, what the GIZ approach to capacity development uh, to tax reform is in these countries. And uh, in doing so, I want to illustrate this by uh, referring to a butterfly. We believe if you really want to do capacity development seriously, uh, you need to get a butterfly flying. And the butterfly has uh, four wings. Uh, the very first one is about policy. Um, the second one is about the organizational level. A third one is about human resources uh, and the individuals in, in, a, in such a system. And the fourth one is about cooperation systems. Well, the very first, which is the, the upper left uh, uh, wing of this butterfly, is well known. This is about tax legislation and rulings. This is about, um, you know, general uh, uh, setting of policies. Uh, also very well known is the organizational level. This is when it comes to uh, setting up revenue authorities, uh, moderniz modernizing core processes, um, and obviously also um, in practice people usually talk about training, uh, that's the, the uh, lower uh, right wing. Uh, but oftentimes what, uh, what we don't uh, really uh, keep in mind is that to make that fly, butterfly actually sort of take off, uh, let's also look at, you know, uh, for instance, coordination among government entities within a country. So not, let's not just look at one tax administration. It's really about linking that tax administration with the Bureau of Statistics, with the Ministry of Finance, etc. So um, in a nutshell, um, that's uh, something that guides our work, and I will come back to that in commenting on the BEPS uh, program. So um, this is just a very uh, a rough overview of uh, what is probably uh, well known to many of you. Uh, this is taken from the OECD uh, BEPS report of July last year, uh, uh, summarized in Chapter 4, uh, uh, some four or five highlights. <laughs> Uh, why uh, BEPS um, uh, would be uh, relevant to low-income countries. 
Um, obviously, the BEPS initiated uh, from um, OECD, from an OECD uh, country perspective, and I think the, the report did a very good job in um, highlighting, you know, what would be the relevance for developing and low-income countries. Um, so um, these are just some of the, the issues that, um, for instance, the nature of cross-border tax planning may, may differ. Um, also that um, legislative measures uh, needed to address BEPS, uh, you know, may not be there in developing countries. Um, they, they highlight the relevance of information, etc. So I'm coming, uh, coming back to some of these uh, in a minute. Now, as I just uh, mentioned uh, a minute ago, um, I, in preparation to this meeting, I actually went back to GIZ staff in the field in uh, five countries. Uh, this is not um, uh, an, an even-based representation, but it's an arbitrary sort of attempt to get some uh, idea of uh, you know, what the situation uh, is on the ground. And uh, again, going back to the butterfly, uh, on the policy and legal framework, that would be the first wing, uh, my colleagues um, on a very anecdotal evidence uh, basically confirmed, yes, there is a basic framework which is in place. It's uh, by and large in, in line with international standards. But there is obviously a need for review and updates, um, uh, updating when it comes to the automatic exchange of information. That's something that we he hear from Ghana. Uh, from El Salvador, but also from Malawi, uh, colleagues said that uh, something like joint audits has never taken place. Advanced pricing agreements is something that, that needs to be done. Uh, similarly, uh, on the organizational capacity, uh, they confirm that in all these countries we have dedicated tax units in place. So these are specialized units within usually large taxpayer organizations who are uh, mandated to address international tax issues. But if you look at the numbers, uh, I think the highest number uh, that came back was from El Salvador with 11 staff. Uh, in, the ca in the case of Serbia, it's actually one person in charge for international tax issues. So you can see, uh, you know, in terms of organizational uh, uh, staffing, this is uh, uh, obviously not sufficient. Uh, and then you can see on this slide, and I'm not going into details here, uh, uh, the need for improvement in a number of areas where things have not started yet or where things are just about to start. For instance, um, you know, dispute resolution in Malawi um, or the general need to deepen the role of these, of these units. Uh, just to, to finalize this, this would be um, uh, the question of what, what does the actual uh, practice look like. Uh, what we hear uh, from my colleagues is that uh, there's certainly a limited exposure to certain practices and approaches right now. For instance, uh, there is no such thing as a joint audit um, among uh, neighboring countries. Um, there is limited coordination among government agencies right now within a country. Uh, they lack manuals, tools, there is not a lot of training. And the issue which was mentioned, I think, uh, today uh, before was the, uh, this, the issue of retaining staff within the unit because once people are trained, they are uh, you know, an easy catch for one of the big five companies to, to leave the administration. So these are the issues. And uh, I would now uh, like to comment on the, um, the key issues that the, the OECD BEPS report uh, last year in July highlighted, which would be relevant with high priority for developing countries. And I want to allocate these issues to the butterfly, as I just explained. So let me take the first one, and th this one is about the effective imp and implementable rules, uh, including transfer pricing um, uh, against base erosion through uh, interest and debt, um, uh, but also royalties, management fees, etc. The problem is well known, and this is obviously something that is in the field of policy and legislation. Also, information reporting requirements uh, that uh, should apply uh, to transfer pricing rules is something that would go into that field. The report also mentions um, the need for an update of internationally development principles to allow effective taxation. So you can see this probably goes in that area. I mean, there's some ambiguity on or where you want to assign this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a bit quicker here now. There are a number of issues that uh, this report highlights, but, the, uh, but what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say here is a lot of these things are actually on the left side, the policy and cooperation systems area. 
Maybe you could uh, assign the uh, issue of comparable data um, to organization. Um, uh, it's a matter of, of uh, uh, where you want to uh, allocate this. Um, and the development effective rules, again, comes to policy. Um, the issue of um, developing guidance on calculation, transparency, costs and benefits of tax incentives is an important issue. It's probably something that has to do with organizational capacity. Okay, finally, the point, what I'm trying to say here is the, the butterfly is really un, unbalanced. And we believe that the BEPS is a very good program. If you a actually implement BEPS, you will go a long way. But um, in terms of capacity de development, this may not be sufficient because you need to address these other, other areas that I mentioned. So um, let me be a bit more specific. I believe that um, you know, the whole BEPS uh, process is certainly a political game. In order to be effective, uh, OECD countries will have to be ready to let tax bases shift, reshift to low-income countries. Um, enacting only a fraction of BEPS measures will certainly require substantial political will in developing countries and with the need to change more than legislation and tax, tax capacity. I believe that in order to be successful, um, you need to strengthen oversight and accountability across government. So it's not sufficient to just look at tax administration uh, because um, the issue is larger. You need to uh, include supreme audit institution oversight. If you don't do that, I, do, I think any capacity approach will ultimately fail. Uh, a number of measures have been suggested uh, over the pro and the process is ongoing. Uh, and I'm going just to, um, to mention uh, two or three. Uh, for instance, the increased or enhanced use of source taxes for certain payments. So a withholding tax on interest payments is something that is, is usually suggested. Uh, the increased use of advanced pricing agreements, a stronger reliance of profit splits methods. Um, uh, as you may know, there is currently um, the commenting process uh, within the OECD BEPS process for stakeholders to comment to what extent we could actually leave behind the uh, arm's length principle uh, for the be benefit of using a more profit split method according to the global value chain. These are valuable things, um, but um, I believe that these measures uh, will uh, help in particular lower middle income countries and more advanced emerging countries, and they may uh, possibly uh, overburden the capacity of low-income countries or least developing countries, uh, sorry, least developed countries. And here, uh, this would be my point, um, careful cost-benefit analysis actually required um, in order to avoid that, you know, you come with very high standards out of this BEPS process and, uh, you know, a country like the Central African Republic and others won't be able to uh, to implement. It's, there's no way to, they can actually implement this. Um, okay, and uh, as I said, a lot of ground can be made instead by, uh, you know, going beyond BEPS and, you know, looking at things like addressing tax incentives. Um, you can actually gain a lot of revenues by closing tax incentives within uh, countries. Uh, addressing the issue of high net worth individuals. Uh, that's an issue in many of, our, of, of developing countries. Uh, but even uh, I, I personally uh, used to live uh, for a number of years in Ghana, and I was uh, amazed uh, to see uh, what uh, rent prices uh, were paid in the capital of Accra. Uh, it could be up to 5,000 US dollars per month. And I can assure you that 95% uh, of this rental income uh, goes untaxed. So you can see, you can get a sense uh, of uh, the potential of revenue for these countries if you look at these domestic issues as well. So let me come to my conclusion. Um, I believe that the BEPS process is actually a very relevant uh, process. It's appropriate, but it should not undermine efforts uh, to uh, strengthen general tax administration capacity because, as I said, a lot of tax evasion actually happens within a country. Uh, the targeted intervention may help uh, in the short run, uh, but in the long run it needs to be uh, complemented by more comprehensive capacity development uh, approaches, and that would include 
strengthening accountability and transparency across government. So I am not, I'm not in favor of just looking uh, you know, at strengthening tax administration. And there is a tendency, in my view, with the um, uh, you know, uh, huge summits that we see this year in Addis Abeba, that you know, the entire development uh, world will just focus on tax administrations. And I think that would be a mistake. We should also uh, focus on supreme audit institutions. We should focus on the budget process in general. And that would be my, my point here. And obviously, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of uh, strengthening uh, uh, you know, uh, technical assistance to, to these institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, well, now uh, I will have to give the floor to Tove Maria Raiden. Tove is the policy and advocacy manager for tax justice in the European Network on Debt and Development and, of course, a member of the Coordination Committee of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. She coordinates tax-related policy positions of EuroDead members and allies and has, among other things, monitored and provided input to the OECD's process on base erosion and profit shifting, the United Nations Tax Committee, the Financing for Development negotiations as well. So, Tove, with pleasure, the floor is yours. That works, yeah. Thank you so much, and I think it's also about time to say thank you so much, Eli, for pushing this and inviting us and being such a champion in the European Parliament. So uh, I'm very, very delighted to see that all this has happened and to be here today. Um, before I start, I was also a, uh, <laughs> I'm not happy, but very interested to see that it looks like we also soon are getting to a point where we can start debating, oops, oops among the panelists. Um, I'm not quite sure about the points you made about BEPS because you say that BEPS is very important and, and very useful, but then you mention that uh, countries will have to be uh, ready to see tax bases shift from, developing, uh, from developed to developing countries. And, and, and for those of you who are not um, OECD Swahili experts, uh, this is one of the fundamental discussions. When we talk about whether the OECD should be running this or whether the United Nations should be running this, one of the basic disagreements is which country gets what taxing right. The OECD leans towards saying that the country where the headquarter of the company is based, that's where the taxing right should be. And it also so happens that many multinationals, in fact, the majority of the multinational companies are based in OECD countries. So translated, it means that the OECD policy says that the taxing rights should mainly be in the OECD countries, and the UN has developed an alternative which has a bit more of a balanced approach. Now, when you say that the OECD countries should be ready to see tax bases shift, and also perhaps taxing rights, one important part was that we actually asked for a negotiation of this in the OECD process. And we got a blank, no, this is not for discussion. So when we sit and say that the OECD is progress, I think we need to nuance it a little bit because the OECD solutions are most likely to build on the OECD regime, which gives a preferential treatment to OECD countries. On the issue of using a profit split, that we should use profit split more, that is something the OECD is starting to discuss a little bit. But also before this, the UN had already come to the conclusion that profit split should be used more because, again, developing countries have pushed this. So I think we should be a bit more nuanced when we look at the OECD and the BEPS process and not assume. It's true that we were very excited when it started, but we also need to look at what's, what's coming out. I mean, on country-by-country country reporting, the European Parliament forced public country-by-country country reporting through, and now the OECD has decided it should be confidential. In their press release, they said a major step forward for transparency, but actually what they're saying is that the Capital Requirements Directive, which gave us public country-by-country country reporting, is apparently not in line with this OECD transparency, which is now about making the information that we got access to secret again, or what is actually going on? I think is an important question to ask. Not to say that everything the OECD BEPS has done is wrong, 
But we need to be very critical of this process and also of the solutions it comes with. So I have some much better solutions for you, and this is what I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, <laughs> we've already fallen into this discussion a little bit. Uh, impact assessment. Let's get a measure of how bad this uh, situation actually is. It's true that the Netherlands already started with a very interesting report on spillover uh, effects. Uh, the IMF also did a spillover effect, which ended with the conclusion that developing countries should be very careful with signing double tax treaties. And of course, again, uh, this is strongly related to the fact that double tax treaties are used for profit shifting. And we also need to look at the, the impacts of financial inequality of tax systems. When we look at tax per GDP, for example, oh, it's going up, that's good. Well, if the taxation falls on the poorest parts of the society, through the value-added tax, the consumption tax that people have to pay, or falls on the small and medium enterprises, or on workers, then perhaps we can see more tax money coming in, but we're actually, to put it bluntly, we're taxing the poor while the rich are not getting taxed. If that's the case, then uh, taxes is not always a good thing. So we need to assess what the impacts of our tax policies are, and of course also internationally. With the current system, there are strong indications that we're basically taking from the poor and transferring to the rich. So, so this is something that we need much more studying of as part of our solutions. Also gender inequality. When we're taxing the poor, it will have a stronger impact on women. And then we need to start cleaning up. There are a bunch of tax policies that are not very helpful. The, the key place to start is uh, tax treaties. So we uh, did a Eurodat study last year where we tried to look at the tax treaties that EU member states have with developing countries. And we looked at how much are the EU countries forcing down the tax rates of the developing countries. Uh, as you can see, the first one who needs to go home and do their homework is, is Spain. And after that, the UK should probably also look at their tax treaties because they're basically forcing down the withholding taxes of developing countries. What it does is it creates holes in the tax system because the withholding tax is something you take on money when it leaves the country. And when you then have a treaty saying that when this type of money goes from my country to that country, it should be taxed less or taxed or not at all taxed, you're creating holes in the system. And this has been abused for uh, profit shifting. Harmful tax practices. This is a very interesting issue. When we talk about how, how great it is that the OECD is talking about the, the problem of, uh, of, of, uh, of the international tax system, let's keep in mind that this discussion about harmful tax practices started in the OECD in the 90s. They realized that this is a very serious issue to address. And then they discussed it, and they discussed it a bit more. And uh, now with the OECD BEPS, they decided to start discussing it again. Um, we're looking at this, trying to see what's coming out of it, because uh, in the beginning there were some concerns raised about patent boxes. But now we see more and more announcement from OECD states that they actually want patent boxes as well, because apparently now they found good patent boxes. Of course, the tax rulings was a big issue with the Luxembourg. So let's look at what's actually going on with these harmful tax practices. Uh, are we getting more or less of these? And uh, here the, in the EU level, we have the Code of Conduct Group for Business Taxation. Uh, this is an uh, intergovernmental body between the EU member states. It's, it's uh, very difficult to find out what this group is actually doing. But last year, they gave a presentation saying that they had removed all harmful tax practices in Europe. That caused us to raise some questions about uh, whether it was really true that their job was, was so successful. So this code of conduct group, we need a mechanism to address harmful tax practices. But if the code of conduct group thinks that everything's going great, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with their approach to harmful tax practices. Tax conditionalities. Um, 
we talk about the developing country tax policies as if it's a, basically something they, they, they came up with on their own and, and now they have tax incentives and they're not managing to tax. To some extent, of course, that's true, but there is also a strong involvement from the outside when it comes to developing country tax policies. So, for example, corporate taxation, sometimes there is a push on a developing country to tax corporates less. It was said that this would uh, invite more investments, but now there are actually studies showing that lowering your corporate tax rate does not improve the investments in your country. There's discussion about whether uh, lowering the corporate tax rate is actually the way to attract investments. But uh, that's beside the point. My point is the fact that the World Bank and the IMF unless they all want to move to a developing country and become active citizens, they should not be setting the tax policies of developing countries. That is a fundamental democratic issue which should be addressed by the citizens of that country. Uh, also, a question we generally have about capacity building is when, when the developing countries are being taught how to tax, which system are they being taught to use? Are they using the OECD system or are they using the UN system? And who is training them? Uh, in some countries, it, it's working really well, but there might be other countries where there is a confusion of roles. So when t uh, the tax administrations in developing countries are trained, it's very important that it's receiver country driven and that it doesn't interfere with their right to make their own tax policies. I have to say this, um, we all speak about the LuxLeaks. There were some people who made the LuxLeaks happen because they took information and they made it available to the public. One of them is uh, Antoine Deltour. What we said, uh, he was the first person to implement public country by country reporting because suddenly we got the truth about some of the deals that had been made in Luxembourg and we could see what was going on. Some reports say he's only facing up to five years. There were also news articles talking about 10 years, but uh, there seems to be quite broad agreement that he risks going to jail. Meanwhile, after the Swiss leaks, we now have a discussion about whether HSBC uh, can really be held accountable for the big problems there have been with the tax dodging in relation to their practices. So we need to look at who we punish. I'm not saying that we generally like to punish people, but when the whistleblowers are going to jail and the tax dodgers go to tropical islands, then there's something fundamentally wrong with our system and we're incentivizing more tax dodging. The enablers, uh, when we got the locks leaks, we also saw that the Price Waterhouse Coopers sometimes plays a very questionable role in relation to taxation. And uh, on the one hand, we, we see them in Luxembourg helping companies find the loopholes. And on the other hand, they also suddenly they're independent consultants, including here in the European Union. I, I typed in Price Waterhouse Coopers to, into the Financial Transparency Registry of the European Union. And these are the numbers that came out. Um, 2013 was a bit better than 2012 because there it was only 17 million euros that Price Waterhouse Coopers received. So my question is, what is this money for? And what is really the role of Price Waterhouse Coopers? What's the role of KPMG? in this system. We need to question that. And we need to make sure that people don't suddenly wear many different hats at once. And then changing the global rulemaking. So once we've cleaned up in the tax policies that we have now, including double tax treaties that undermine developing countries, we need to look at where did these rules come from and how can we prevent that they also reappear in the future. Um, Katrine already very helpfully outlined this. Basically, you have on the left side, you have the OECD and G20 countries, and on the right side, you have the least developed countries. The least developed countries are currently not represented in the OECD, and by definition, the G20, you have to be a rather large country before you get invited to become a G20 member. So uh, we do have least developed countries sitting at the table in the United Nations. They have been for many years. And this is a fundamental part of how we get good tax policies in the future. There are more than 100 countries that have not been at the table when global 
tax policies were developed. Where is the democracy in that? I'm often being told that the UN is, is very ineffective and inefficient. Well, <laughs> to some extent, democracy is a bit more complicated than if a small group of countries just sits down and decides the tax policies for everyone else. That doesn't make it right. So, we mentioned also the negotiations about the Financing for Development Conference that's going to happen in Addis Ababa in uh, July. And uh, the negotiations are already ongoing. And uh, this uh, intergovernmental body on tax, this is basically a request to have a UN negotiation where the developing countries are present and participating and can represent their own interest. And uh, we had a statement from uh, more than 130 developing countries in January and also before then, saying that they want a global inclusive and norm setting body for international tax cooperation. They think there's not enough focus on the development dimension and uh, that this new body should be one of the key deliverables in Addis Ababa. Now, a key question that, that we ask at the moment is, what is the position of the European Union? Uh, the European Union has repeatedly rejected this demand from developing countries to get a seat at the table. But in January, there was an EU statement that, was, uh, that, that puzzled us and made us very interested. So, so the EU said something along the lines of uh, that a cost-benefit analysis should be performed on uh, this proposal and uh, that the mandate should be clarified also before uh, we get to Addis Ababa, and that there should be an analysis of how the institutions we already have uh, can, can complement and what the gaps are, and that we should avoid wasteful duplication. So this is a more nuanced position than we have previously seen from the European Union. Um, I have a specific question on what the position of Germany is because Germany took, took the floor right after this and said something that sounded like we disagree with what the European Union just said uh, and how we need to keep the institutions we already have. So there seems to be a, a, a lively debate and it, it's a bit unclear what the European Union is, is currently saying on this question. But uh, we think it's a key part to avoiding that in the future we have more fair tax policies. Uh, finally, just a comment on uh, there are a lot of people who say that uh, to have a functioning tax system we need things like a unitary taxation system and we need to address uh, incentives and, and we need a lot of things. The reason why we focus on this body is because I don't want anyone negotiating a global tax system before we have somewhere where the developing countries, including the least developed countries, can come and sit down and represent their point of view. So first we need a mechanism to make sure that we can have negotiations and then I'm very thrilled for developing countries and developed countries to negotiate some better rules. Last point on the European Investment Bank and, and uh, how uh, generally uh, the IFIs should, should play a, a more proactive role in this. Uh, we, of course, fully agree with that. Uh, just last week, we, we finally... Uh, heard from Counterbalance that they got the report about the Glencore case. So the Glencore case is basically a discussion with the European Investment Bank about whether they can at least stop funding the projects that are part of profit shifting. And this has been a very long discussion is, what are you funding? What are you investing in? Are you investing directly in cases that lead to profit shifting? The Glencore Mopani case is a very, very ugly case from Zambia. And we've been wanting to, to have access to the report that the European Investment Bank did about uh, this uh, case because they internally acknowledged that perhaps this wasn't their, their most... Um, <laughs> their most fortunate investment. So, so first, we, we want transparency around what they're investing in to start with to make sure they're not funding the problem. And, and the second question is, is your money going through tax havens? This is also a problem we have with development finance institutions. Uh, they, they tell us things about how in order to have efficient investments, you need to run them through tax havens. We have a lot of questions about that. Uh, the, the, first, the first ask we have is transparency around what they're actually doing. We did have a meeting with them last uh, November 
and it was a very heated discussion. But we, we saw it as a good first step that at least we had a, a whole day in the same room. And we, we did seem to come to some conclusions about how more transparency would be a good start. So a, a careful baby steps forward, I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dove. That was uh, really straight to the point and direct, as you always are. So last speaker um, for today's workshop is Joseph Stad. Joseph is Christian Aid's senior economic justice advisor, primarily focusing on the relationship between tax and development and the related EU and UK policies, and leads Christian Aid's policy on automatic information ex uh, um, exchange of information, beneficial ownership, and country-by-country -country reporting. So, Joseph, thanks for coming, and the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Ali, for, uh, for hosting this and, uh, and for the setting up this report. I'm, uh, I think it's, it's a great time to happen. Um, one of the benefits of coming last is most of the things I'm about to say have already been said, so I'll... Uh, I'll see what I can do to bring something new to this. I wanted to focus on kind of some of the aspects around transparency. Uh, it's something that's been mentioned a lot already, and I think there's some areas where there's some really uh, good opportunities for uh, the EU to take the, take the lead on this. And I think the first thing we need to kind of focus on the fact is, you know, the reason why we need transparency is there's so much we don't know. Um, we've seen that disclosures and leaks have been driving the debate um, across the across the EU and across the world. We've seen the impact of the Luxembourg and Swiss leaks here in the EU. Um, Tove just mentioned it, but the, uh, the Glencore case in Zambia was the, the leak, a leak from the, the auditors who were looking into Glencore's activities in Zambia and uh, identified potentially huge scale of, uh, of tax avoidance. And certainly estimates from the, the Zambian government is that tax avoidance in the, the copper sector in, uh, in Zambia as a whole could be costing up to $2 billion a year. Um, but the fact is we just don't know because we only get small nuggets of information from some of these leaks. And I don't think it's enough to have to rely on leaks. It's great that we do see whistleblowers that uh, are willing to take that risk and, uh, and put information out there, but it's not really what we should be uh, relying on. Um, you know, and the thing is, this is only the, tip, the iceberg. There's so much stuff that we just don't know. So if you look at the, on companies, we did some work in Christian Aid in our report uh, foot secrecy last year, looking at the FTSE 100 companies and trying to find out how much information can you actually get if you get access to supposedly the world's most comprehensive and uh, informative database on company ownership, which usually costs in the order of six, uh, six figures a year to access. They gave us a discount. Don't worry, we're not spending all our charitable money on, uh, on that. Um, but the information was startling. Um, if you try and look at the subsidiaries of FTSE 100 companies, over 20% of those subsidiaries, you can find out no information whatsoever. It's impossible to know what these subsidiaries are up to. It's impossible to know what's going on. And I'm pretty sure if that's the state of play for the, uh, the top 100 companies in the UK, then it's likely to be the same in many other countries uh, around the world. Um, in terms of the cash, where is the cash actually held? Um, we have all kinds of estimates as to how much money is held offshore, but actually which cash from which country is held where we have very little about. Swiss leaks has helped us. We know how much from different countries is in uh, HSB in Switzerland, or was. It's probably all moved a bit now. Um, but we, uh, you know, in terms of actually where, where it all is, it's really difficult to know. There's estimates, um, and the estimates for developing countries are startling, whereas the world average uh, estimate is about 6 to 8% of assets are held offshore. In Africa, they reckon it's between 30 and 33%. In Latin America, around 25%. This is a huge amount of the capital of these countries that is being held in other, other places. It's not being taxed. It's not available locally for, uh, for domestic investment. This is a huge problem. But in terms of actually knowing where it is and being able to get that, the, those lines of accountability and so that countries can actually ask of other jurisdictions what's going on, we just don't know this information. Um, in terms of tax incentives, we've, uh, we've had a lot of talk about them already, uh, but many countries have no idea on the costs, or indeed if these incentives are incentivizing what they're meant to be doing. Um, we've certainly, you know, and this isn't just a developing country issue, it, it exists in all, uh, all countries. You know, we've, uh, we've been looking into it in the UK, we have something of the order of 1,100 tax incentives in the UK, um, somewhere of the order of about 10% of those of any kind of evaluation. 
Um, and, uh, and some of those evaluations have been in very curious manners to assess whether the, uh, the recent cuts in corporation tax have been effective in the UK. We, we asked HMRC and the Treasury how they'd assessed whether this was doing well. They said they'd asked the companies, and the companies said it was a good policy and working well. I'm not entirely sure that's the level of transparency we want around tax incentives. Um, and, uh, and gender. I mean, this is an area that we're starting to look at at Christian Aid, and the gender impacts of tax systems are incredibly poorly understood. Just in terms of data, we often don't disaggregate data down in terms of uh, which gender is paying uh, the various taxes. Also, in terms of uh, you know, so where the tax burden, uh, burden lies, again, these things are very poorly understood. We've done a couple of kind of small-scale studies. Uh, in, we've done one in Ghana, and we, we're aware of another one in Vietnam that seems to suggest that where you have female-headed uh, businesses or the types of businesses that are generally more likely to be female-headed, they tend to be taxed more highly. And so there does seem to be issues around in terms of uh, female access into the uh, into workforce and businesses. So there's all kinds of issues here that are really, uh, really important around understanding how our tax systems work that uh, we just don't have any data on. Um, so what do we need to do? The, the phrase is, sunlight is the best disinfectant, so we need to spread some sunlight around the world. Um, country by country reporting, we've already talked about, uh, talked about this a bit, and I think there is, there's two key factors that we need to stress about country by country reporting. First, it needs to be public. And secondly, it needs to be comprehensive. So at the minute in the EU, we have two aspects of country-by-country country reporting. We have country-by-country country reporting on uh, revenues paid to, uh, to governments by extractive industries, and we have the reporting that's required in the uh, Capital Requirements Directive. Uh, both of those are public, which is great. Um, neither of those are as comprehensive as what is being proposed in the OECD's country-by-country uh, country reporting template. Um, they also need to be comprehensive in terms of the companies that they cover. Again, in the EU, we have, um, we have it for extractive industries and for banks. We need this to happen for all, all companies. Certainly when you look in developing countries, which sectors are likely to be most uh, likely to be involved in tax evasion? Yes, extractive industries are up there, but also you have like, the likes of construction companies, telecommunication companies. You know, there's a whole range of companies that, uh, that are likely to take advantage of these things. We've seen it through, uh, through what we've seen in the various cases in the, uh, in the EU. You know, uh, Fiat's been investigated, Starbucks has issues, Amazon, Google. You know, these are not just extractive industries and banks. Um, I think one of the other things to, uh, to stress, as well as the fact we need all companies and we need a decent range of data, is actually most companies are expecting this to happen. Uh, PwC did a survey um, of chief execs last year, and one of the findings was that the majority of them expect there to be new regulations on actually putting out uh, more data around their operations in countries around the world. Companies are kind of expecting this to happen, um, and most of them it just seems to be are trying to put it off for as long as possible, but they know it's coming down the line. And there is a huge potential here for developing countries. You know, when, we, when we speak to uh, developing countries you know, in and around the BEPS process, they say one of the things they, they're really hopeful for is that country-by-country country reporting is going to be uh, going to really help them identify where there may be risks that are losing, uh, losing tax revenues. Problem is, the OECD is in danger of ruining it. Um, you know, the proposals that are out there, they limit the range of companies that will have to report. It's only the biggest ones, over 750 million euros in terms of turnover. They want to limit the use to which country-by-country uh, country reporting can be put. So the way that they're trying to, uh, to set this up is that uh, you can only use these reports if you're putting it to, uh, to the use of enforcing the arms length principle. You can't, you can't go can't go beyond that. If you're looking to how you might want to reform your tax policy in your country and it's found out that you've been using country by country template reports for this, they want to try and st stop you being able to access this. Now, how can they stop you accessing this? Well, this is the other problem that the OECD model is, uh, danger of putting in place. Rather than the country by country report going straight to each tax authority where a multinational company is operating, which seems entirely logical, that would get the information to where you need it to be. The OECD is recommending that the country-by-country country report only be submitted to the tax authorities in the country where the multinational is headquartered, and it can then be shared through information exchange agreements with the other countries where the, uh, the multinational operates. 
um, which has all kinds of problems. Um, firstly, in terms of it putting an extra level of complication and administration and expense in terms of getting it to the countries that need it. Secondly, lots of developing countries don't have information exchange agreements, and certainly not with all the countries where the multinationals that may be operating their country are headquartered. Um, and, uh, and so there's real issues in terms of are they actually going to be able to access this. And the third area is it's not entirely clear what legal method through information exchange agreements you will be able to request this document. So it's not covered by current automatic information exchange provisions, so it won't be sent automatically. Um, it doesn't seem like it would fit under the spontaneous information exchange requirements because you have to have a suspicion that there has been a, uh, a tax loss to, the, to another country to exchange information spontaneously. Um, so you can't just blanketly say we think, we think that there's a tax loss, have the multinational, uh, have the country by country report unless we're assuming that all multinationals are engaged in this kind of stuff. That may be a valid assumption, but I couldn't possibly say. Um, and, uh, and so it doesn't look like you can exchange it under spontaneous information request, which leaves you with the third method of information exchange, which is on request. The problem with that is you need to know a lot of information before you can make a request. The country by country report is supposed to be a high level risk identification tool. Now, the, it seems this catch-22 situation to have to have identified a risk to then be able to request the risk identification tool. Um, and so there really does seem to be some problems here, and the OECD is in genuine danger of ruining um, the, uh, the process of country-by-country uh, -country reporting. Um, we can look at information exchange. Um, again, there's a risk that developing countries are going to be excluded here. Um, Everyone agrees that automatic information exchange is, uh, is, you know, is where we're headed, but it's how do you get developing countries into this process? And they need to be in there. You know, as we said, the estimates are that around 30% of African uh, assets are held offshore. They need to know information about where this is. But the problem is the standard requires that uh, every country that is receiving information uh, also has to have the uh, systems in place to send information out. For many developing countries, that, um, that will create some difficulties to it. And there's understandable concern from many developing country authorities when we speak to them is you know, there's a risk that they signed up for automatic information exchange to get a lot of information in, but because they haven't been able to set up, the set up sending information back out again properly, they instantly become blacklisted by the OECD Global Forum. And, you know, and that's a really big risk that needs to be mitigated for developing countries coming in, which is why we say we need some degree of asymmetry. Give developing countries some leeway before they run the risk of being blacklisted uh, when they come into this automatic information exchange system. Um, you know, and I think there's a really great way to kind of link in giving this kind of asymmetry along with some of the kind of capacity building stuff that we, we've heard of. I think you can have really good integrated programs to be, to be done here. And I think you know, some of the proposals from the Global Forum around setting up partnership systems with developed countries, there's lots of things that the European Union can look at here in terms of how we coordinate EU member states and indeed EU development assistance to be part of that and to really kind of help get this, this process going. Um, there's also some sp space for public transparency around information exchange. Um, so in terms of actually finding out where the cash is. So the Bank of International Settlements, they have a lot of information on direct country, uh, country positions in terms of which country's uh, residence cash is in their banks. That covers a number of the bank, uh, a number of the tax havens. That information's collected, it's just not made available. And so uh, we're calling for, and one has got a great campaign uh, action online at the minute, which I encourage you all to sign, calling for the Bank of International Settlements to make this data public. Similarly, in terms of automatic information exchange, we can aggregate some of the data to say, you know, just how much information has been sent over, you know, so information about how many individuals, um, how much in terms of assets has actually been sent over. So then we can hold our governments to account in terms of, well, you, we know you've received, you know, this amount of information. What have you done with it? You know, um, you know, the, uh, the Swiss League stuff has shown that, uh, that people really do want to hold their governments to account on this. We've seen in the UK that, you know, there's somewhere in the region of 3,000 uh, UK residents had, uh, had accounts in HSBC in Switzerland, and we've prosecuted one of them. 
which compares very unfavorably to what France and Spain has, has done. And I think if we had some of this aggregate data from uh, automatic information exchange, you'd be able to see that kind of accountability really spread, uh, spread around the world and would really be a great tool to make sure that this, uh, this inform information flow is used. And certainly is a, is a risk in some developing countries. Some of them may be slightly reticent towards uh, getting, uh, participating in automatic information exchange because some of the elites may well be the ones who have their money stashed offshore. And so you know, we need ways to be able to get the accountability going and so that you can get citizens to demand uh, action being taken. Um, where else do we want to see more, uh, more transparency? Around incentives. Um, so there's a whole range of ideas that we can have around incentives. Uh, some of them aren't mine. Some of them came from the, uh, the G20, OECD, World Bank, and UN in a report they gave to the G20 back in 2011. Um, you know, and the simplest one is when companies are engaged in negotiating tax incentives, make sure the revenue authorities and the finance ministries know. Because you do have this situation in many developing countries that the, uh, the Ministry of Mines negotiates a contract, uh, puts in a different tax rate for that. No one bothered to tell the revenue authorities or the finance ministry, and so all the estimates go out the window. Um, and companies should be making sure that this happens. Again, this isn't my recommendation. This is a recommendation of the OECD, World Bank, IMF, UN in their report to the G20. Um, incentives need to be transparent. They need to be costed and they need to be evaluated. Again, you know, incentives are the clues in the name. They're supposed to be incentivizing something. They're supposed to be encouraging something to happen. If no one goes back and checks if that thing happened, then what's the point? How do we know if they're actually working as incentives? Um, again, very few of these, uh, uh, very few incentives are actually treated in this way. And again, this is not a problem just for developing countries. This is something you can see in all countries. Um, one of the, uh, the OECD has actually come up with some very good guidelines around what incentives uh, programs for developing countries should look like. And I remember being in the meeting of the OECD Tax and Development Task Force and said, you know, look, I think, I think these are all really good ideas. This is great. What I don't understand is why the OECD is telling developing countries this is what they should be doing when this isn't actually, you know, an OECD policy for OECD countries too. You know, so would the OECD CFA like to adopt this as an OECD position? And there was much, much laughter at the idea that OECD countries would adopt this. But I think, you know, what we're seeing in a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the debate around tax at the minute is actually, you know, there are things that we should be doing in our own countries that would show good example and best practice for developing countries. And again, you know, this isn't just my words, but the, uh, the OECD, bizarrely, and the UN, IMF, and, uh, and World Bank in that report to the G20 did say that developed countries should be leading the way in terms of transparency and accountability around incentives. Um, and I think, you know, this helps us get to the... You know, this idea around cooperation and accountability around incentives are vital. Um, and again, you know, we're seeing this issue around tax, beggar thy neighbor tax in incentives around the EU, in, be it in patent boxes or rulings or whatever. You know, the EU is supposedly the world's leading regional uh, economic body. We're supposed to be the best people at cooperation um, across borders. If we can't show the way in terms of you can get past tax, you know, harmful tax competition and into genuine cooperation, to ensure tax revenues are raised, then you know, what do we expect other regional bodies to be able to do? Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in incentives. Um, and on gender, I mean, again, it is the case that we're starting from a very, very low base on, on a lot of these gender issues. So we do need baseline studies in all countries, again, not just in developing countries, but we can see it in all countries, you know, what actually is going on in terms of how our tax systems affect women and men differently. And you, know, and you could also look in terms of other, uh, other dimensions in, uh, in society as well where tax systems may operate differently. Um, so what's the role for the European Parliament since I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to, uh, to you today? Well, I thought it was really good to kind of look back and see the last time the European Parliament really engaged in this back in 2011 when we had, um, we had kind of council conclusions, we had commission recommendations, and we had European Parliament uh, position. Um, and if you look back from what was said from those and what, where we are sitting now, it was the European Parliament that was setting the current agenda. The European Parliament called for review of global tax rules. The European Parliament called for automatic information exchange. The European Parliament called for country-by-country -country reporting. They were the most ambitious 
in terms of uh, where we were in 2011. And actually, we've seen you know, progress on all of those areas. You know, what the European Parliament position was before is the closest resemblance to what we're actually dealing with now. So it shows that when the European Parliament sets that ambition, you can set the agenda and you can really make us deliver. If we just have settled with what the Council conclusions were, then you know, we wouldn't be sitting where we are today in terms of a lot of the progress. So I think that is a real kind of uh, hope and an optimism for what, what can be done in, in a report like this and from uh, MEPs. Is, you know, there's a real opportunity to set that agenda and to be really ambitious. So, I mean, most of these will come as no surprise, but, you know, what can you do? Deliver country-by-country country reporting. There's a whole host of opportunities seem to be coming up this year, be it through the Shareholders' Rights Directive, be it through putting pressure on the Commission for what their transparency package is going to be in March. Um, you know, we've seen it before in the Capital Requirements Directive. You know, you're very good at finding ways to get country-by-country country reporting onto the agenda and push it into, uh, into legislation. You know, carry on, we're with you all the way on that. Uh, but, you know, really get it delivered, make sure it covers all companies, and make sure we have comprehensive enough data. Um, so in terms of ensuring developing countries benefit from automatic information exchange, you know, do it account to advocate for asymmetry to allow developing countries to get in there. Um, in terms of, you know, confidentiality, it's clearly a concern, and we understand it, that you know, taxpayers want to make sure that their data will be treated confidentially. But the risk is the model of automatic information exchange that we have essentially gives chance for every single country to you know, come up with its own standard on whether, uh, whether a developing country reaches the standard on confidentiality. I think there's a real role for the European Union to, kind of, you know, to help say there's a single standard of confidentiality. You know, so so if, if one country says, you know, this country meets, you know, we're happy with that, we're willing to exchange it, other countries follow suit. And to make sure that countries such as Switzerland and the Bahamas, which have clearly said they will exchange countries with those that they have a political and economic necessity to check, exchange information with, not whether or not they meet an objective standard of confidentiality or not, just if they have a political and economic reason to do so. We need to have ways to put pressure on that, and I think a single European standard on this kind of thing can, uh, can really pay dividends. And again, publishing aggregate data, you know, getting some, of those, some data that we can get out there that allows accountability uh, on these things. Um, EU can lead by transparency on incentives and contracts. You know, ensure, uh, ensure that we do have transparency over what we're doing in the EU with incentives. Ensure that contract, you know, there is open and public contracting for, uh, for companies that are looking to get EU money. Let's have the names of who the beneficial owners are from these companies. Let's have as much detail as we can from these contracts. And let's try and find ways to ensure that EU companies are not abusing their power abroad when they're negotiating incentives. I think there's a lot of scope to... Uh, to A, kind of lead by example, and B, to, uh, to try and put the, the influence on our companies operating abroad. And again, on gender impact analysis of tax, tax systems, you know, again, this is a, uh, a universal issue. So again, the stuff we can do within the EU and also support developing countries to do it. You know, and I think the main thing to say as well is all of these issues here are on the agenda for financing for development. And both in financing for development and in the sustainable development goals, one of the big things is about this is supposed to be a universal agenda. We're looking for universal goals. And so therefore, I think, you know, looking at some aspects that require us to do things here within the EU in terms of our transparency, you know, really fit within that agenda and really help us make the case, you know, this is what we expect transparent and accountable tax systems to look like. We'll live that practice here and we'll support developing countries as much as they can to del deliver it as well. And I think that becomes a really kind of exciting package uh, of things that we can do that, you know, has benefits both here and developing countries and really lives the, uh, the promise of what the Sustainable Development Goals universality agenda is supposed to be. And I'm hoping that's my last slide. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. That was also very, very interesting. So now um, we have some more time for a debate. But before, I wanted to thank the colleague that is leaving right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I have to um, excuse myself. Uh, the colleague Van, Den uh, Van Denken de, de Lere, I think, uh, was here from the very beginning. And uh, we, I thank him for that. And also the colleague Stelius and the colleague uh, Miguel Viergas, right? Hi, nice to meet you. Um, so we can open the floor now for uh, questions, comments, and uh, of course, um, I'll be glad to give you the floor. 
if you have anything to add, any questions, don't be shy. Anyway, before, oh, okay, there's, there's one, but just before my colleague leaves, let me just say that uh, I see this workshop as a start. I mean, we have to work for months, and I'd be very glad to, uh, to co-work with, uh, uh, with the shared rapporteurs on the same report, and, uh, and, and also to, um, to keep the discussion between us uh, along the work that we're going to do in this, in this parliament, in the DEVA committee. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for these uh, very interesting uh, introductions, presentations. Uh, my name is Satu Vasamokoskin and I represent the Confederation Finnish Industries. And uh, a question came to my mind uh, regarding uh, Ms. Reading's uh, presentation when you were saying that uh, there should be a body where um, also, the, also the developing countries have a seat in uh, developing those taxation policies. Um, I'm sure uh, you already know the answer to my question, but my question is uh, how would you make sure that this person representing a specific country would be, um, uh, would be the right person uh, in the negotiations? What I mean, the right person, I mean two things. First, uh, to have all the necessary um, uh, skills, capacity, uh, advice, uh, resources to, to fully participate and, uh, you know, you uh, probably understand what I mean, that there, it would be an equal negotiation situation. And, my, uh, and also what I mean about um, the right person, I mean that, that this person would um, really negotiate for the whole nation. Um, and in that I also think that you know <laughs> what I'm pointing to. So thank you. That was my question. Thank you. Any other questions to collect? Or we can start with the answers. Okay. Okay. Tove, floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for, this is a very, very important question. Uh, I've, I've followed UN negotiations for over 10 years now. I've also followed OECD negotiations. And uh, one important difference is that in the United Nations, when governments present their positions, I can go there, I can sit in the room, or I can just sit at home and watch the live stream. In the OECD, we were in a very strange consultation where the, all the member states were there, and we had an all-day discussion. Uh, I had a long discussion with Volvo uh, about whether we should only have OECD papers in English or it should be translated into other countries. The OECD member states almost didn't speak. There was almost nothing. And then they closed the doors and then started the government negotiations. And I could not, I had no idea what, uh, what my government was saying on behalf of my country. And I, I think in the United Nations, at least I can see what the European Union position is. So one of my personal strong ambitions for getting to the United Nations is actually the transparency that comes with it. Uh, the, the lack of transparency is often associated with developing countries, that, that's not my impression. So, uh, so it's true that I, I think there's no person at the moment who can negotiate all tax policies. It is insanely complex. And, and I think we also need to ask ourselves the question, was it a coincidence that it became this complex? If you want to talk about multinationals uh, not paying taxes, is BEPS really the best way to uh, communicate if you want people to understand what's being negotiated. The rules are extremely technical and they're extremely complicated and the language is impossible. And after the first year of OECD BEPS, the result was 700 more pages that I, I tried to look through to, 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 to try and see what was happening. So we do need the transparency to make sure that there can be a, an accountability of whoever is negotiating on behalf of developing countries and on behalf of developed countries. But we also need a more open and political process to make sure that we have a debate about what, it, what, is, what are they actually saying? What are they negotiating about? But uh, again, also at the end of the day, that the key reason why we want developing countries to sit at the table is we, we normally use a, a quote from an American senator to explain uh, when, when we look at the current tax policies that basically put the taxing rights in OECD countries at the expense of developing countries, we, we usually say that it, it appears that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Apparently, all the other countries agree that they should have the taxing rights instead of you. We need to do something about this fundamental problem with the taxing policies. 
Thank you. Is there anything else? Yeah, okay. of course. Uh, thanks. Uh, I would like to react also. And I think uh, your question is very important. That raises uh, many issues. The first one, uh, that is what I mentioned in my intervention, of course, uh, uh, transparency is important. Uh, to announce measures to increase transparency is very important. But we need, uh, and this is our position, we have uh, four years ago we came with a communication on tax and development. And what we said, we need to put all these things in the comprehensive framework of governance. And there are three dimensions, because we cannot divide the issue on the bad and good guys, because uh, there are three dimensions. One is the public uh, governors, governments. And as you said, those that go to negotiate, governments, they need to have the capacity to negotiate. They need also to be accountable to their own citizens when they go to negotiate. So this is one issue that uh, we, we need all these measures when it comes at country level, because at the end, whatever the standards that you decide, at the end this has to end up in the kind of uh, legislation at the country level has to be enforced in compliance at the country level. So this is one issue. The other issue, of course, uh, this is what is, m m I think, uh, the main debate today is about corporate governance. There is a lot of things to do that nobody denies. Uh, there is a lot. But also we cannot see those as the bad guys. There is a lot of things that we need to improve in terms of corporate governance. The issue where it is more difficult to deal uh, is the global governance. At the EU level, we can address the issue on the, at the regional level if we consider ourselves as the main the blo uh, regional bloc in the world. But uh, it's true that, the, and I agree with my colleagues, we don't have a single institution that can represent the global issues on taxation. I remember maybe some of you knows the former director of the Fiscal Affairs Department, Vitor Tanzi, who said maybe we have to think about a double TO, which means World, Tra World Tax Organization, to deal with those issues. Of course, OECD is not representative of the world. G20 is not also. UN is struggling to get this committee uh, to be transformed on the intergovernmental uh, body. But the work with the UN is also progressing. And I profit this opportunity to reply to the challenge that was raised by my colleague regarding the, our position uh, to this committee. We have been working with the UN. The, the UN manual on, manual on transfer pricing, we have supporting this with our colleagues from DG Tax Sud and is very much based on the OECD transfer pricing standards. So uh, th there is no contradiction when it comes at the technical level. Of course, uh, there are some corrections. The problem is when it comes in the accountability and in, 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 the, in the governance. Now, to transform this on the intergovernmental level, this is, uh, and you, uh, you, you quote mentioned the, the last position that came from Brussels after consultation of these different services, we needed to understand much better. There are plenty of treaties, pre plenty of conventions at the uh, UN level that has been approved and there is no implementation at the country level. So we cannot dissociate these three levels of governance uh, if we want uh, to put things in right when it comes to uh, the taxation issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Korea Nunes. Um, is there any other comments also from our panelists or uh, uh, any other question? If not, I will just go to very shortly conclude this very helpful meeting of ours. Um, thanking you once again for uh, uh, being here with us today. It was, I think, very important in view of the uh, first draft of the report on which uh, we'll have to work in these next few days. Um, I think that it's, I mean, I, I heard many, many interesting things today. Um, one of them, I mean, I would, I would start from the last thing that uh, Joseph said, remembering uh, I was also a reporter, shadow reporter on the um, SDGs and the new development uh, framework after 2015, the universality of the new framework 
uh, is very important, so maybe one of the most important af aspects of the whole challenges uh, that we're facing up to New York. Uh, and I, th I really think that, as you said, you, you all said that today we have a momentum here. And, uh, and, and we have it also because we are discussing these things and these matters at a European level on one side. But because these are not European challenges alone, these are global challenges in the days and in the times in which you can actually move huge capitals with a couple of clicks. And, and in the times in which it's easier today uh, to open up um, uh, a phantom firm uh, or a shell company, I mean, uh, a phantom firm, then it's easier than even, I don't know, making a, you know, the driver license, for example. So in these days, uh, it's very important to understand that this is a global issue, this is a global threat, let me say, and that's, um, n n that is why it's so important for us to find new European and international instruments to fight those challenges, because if not, we're not, be, we're not going to be effective. So uh, I think that is one of the most important aspects that you, you've raised in, the, in, in, your, uh, in your intervention. Um, a very good friend of mine, uh, a journalist from Italy, um, wrote a book which is called Caccia al Tesoro, Treasure Hunt. And in that book she uh, says, she estimates that there are uh, 32 trillions uh, around the, in, 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 you know, in uh, international tax havens in, in, in the whole uh, world. Uh, can you think about that? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wealth that is growing because it's often invested as well. So it's practically on our head and, and trying to <laughs> fall on our head. So before that happens, I really hope that, as you said, this parliament will have a role. This committee will have a role in this whole debate, together with the, you know, also the discussion in the Econ Committee and in the Special Committee on, on the same issues for uh, the European Union. Um, well, let me say one last thing because <laughs> it's 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 fun. I mean, uh, you probably don't know that I'm in Italian map, but I was born in Switzerland and I grew up in Switzerland and that is how I am so sensitive about the subject of tax evasion. So thank you very much once again and I hope to work along with you till the report is done. Thank you very much.